SEP Fanfic Readings presents Osculum Enum by My Delphi. Chapter 6 Sixth Year, Part 3. Malfoy's mouth was infuriatingly distracting. While Hermione tried to come up with reasons why she should be allowed to worry about whomever she wanted, even Slytherins, who had at times been quite nasty to her, before beginning to act like the most intriguing enigma, Malfoy's silky tongue brushed against her lips and Oh. Hermione sighed quietly as she sunk into the kiss. Malfoy's fingers were nice and warm where they caressed her jaw, sliding into her hair and gently tugging on her curls. A surprised gasp escaped her, and she could feel him smile against her mouth. Her first instinct was to shove him away, or maybe kick his shin. But then he crowded closer, and Hermione melted against him, lowering himself to his knees between her legs. The warmth of his body radiated against her own, making shivers race down her spine. He pushed against her, or maybe Hermione tugged him down with her, until she was laying on her back. The stairs were uncomfortable and pushed into her back painfully, and she hissed quietly into the kiss. Almost immediately, Malfoy pulled away, and that was not what she wanted at all. But before she could make a noise of protest or pull him back towards her, he was holding his wand, and then magic whispered through the air and suddenly the hard stairs were soft and comfortable. Cushioning charm, her mind supplied helpfully, while Malfoy's wand clattered to the ground because his hand was back in her hair and his lips were meeting hers again. She welcomed the intrusion of his tongue with a small noise, trying to copy his teasing and careful licks. Hermione was all too aware that she lacked experience when it came to kissing. Victor had always kept their kisses chaste, like the secretly shy young man he was, and the only person she had been truly kissed by was Malfoy. Malfoy, who didn't seem to mind her inexperience one bit, because he became even more eager if possible. And that lessened her nervousness. She lost herself in his next kiss, running her hands over his shoulders while his own wandered down her sides until they reached her hips. His fingers paused, and his eyes flickered up to her, asking a silent question. And although he didn't say anything— and he had never truly been a pleasant person to be around, Hermione knew that if she said no, he would accept it, and not hold it against her. But Hermione didn't want to say no. She wanted more, at least a little bit. So she nodded, and something flashed in Malfoy's eyes. She could see how his throat bobbed as he swallowed, and suddenly his easy confidence and natural air of self-assurance was gone, and he appeared just as nervous and inexperienced as she felt. Merlin. His fingers were shaking where they brushed against the hem of her shirt. And then they met the bare skin of her waist, and she shivered at the almost painful goosebumps that spread across her skin. Malfoy's gaze seemed glued to his hand, but he didn't try to pull her shirt up. Instead, his hand merely wandered higher, up the ladder of her ribs, until they suddenly met the cup of her plain cotton bra. Her gasp was mirrored by his throaty, Granger. And then Malfoy paused again, seeking permission once more. Hermione nodded, arching her back slightly so that she was pressing her chest against his hand, and that was all the confirmation he needed. His fingers pushed against the wiring of her bra, moving it aside until he was able to cup her breast. The noise that escaped the back of his throat sounded almost pained. His head dropped against her shoulder as his fingers flexed. You shouldn't let me do this he whispered, lips brushing against her skin. You're so pure, so good. I'm not right for you. Malfoy sounded almost feverish, but he didn't remove his hand. Shushing him, Hermione wrapped her arms around his shoulders and held him close as he explored. It felt strange to have someone else touching her like that. Strange, but nice and exciting, and— a surprised whimper escaped her when his thumb brushed against her pebbling nipple, and Malfoy's body jerked, his hips flexing unintentionally. It made something warm and solid grind against her core, and a high, needy noise echoed from the walls. She needed a second to comprehend that it had come from her, and she didn't find it in herself to feel ashamed. Not when she felt so good. Tingling and light and warm and wanton. Her thighs closed around his hips almost like a reflex, as if trying to pull him closer, getting him to do it again. Granger. Malfoy breathed reverently into her neck 
and Hermione could already feel herself grow impatient when he did it again. The movement was stilted and awkward, and Hermione was suddenly flooded with the realization that maybe Malfoy hadn't done this before either. He was certainly an experienced kisser, but that seemed to be about it. Hermione wondered if that time at the Yule Ball had been the first time Draco Malfoy had touched a woman's chest, and if this was another first for him as well. But if he got to explore, why should she not? Removing one hand from his hair, she hesitantly snuck it between the two of them, to brush against the collar of his dark shirt. Malfoy seemed to understand what she was trying to do, because he brought a bit of space between them so she could move better. It also gave her a chance to see his face, and for the first time since the beginning of the school year, he looked entirely unguarded. There were two blotches of pink high on his sharp cheekbones, and his hair was deliciously tussled. Together with his swollen lips and the eagerness in his eyes, Hermione briefly worried her heart might give out. It was certainly racing hard enough for her to feel her pulse all the way to the tips of her fingers. Maybe it was Malfoy's heartbeat that she could feel, where she was touching his chest. What a nice thought. Hermione's throat clicked as she swallowed, because suddenly her mouth felt very, very dry. This was the first time she touched another body so intently. Yes, she was very tactile and hugged Ron and Harry often enough to know how hard male bodies were, but to purposefully touch Malfoy in such a way was very different. Where her chest was soft due to her breast, his was flat and hard, lean muscle undoubtedly acquired from all the time spent on a broom. She followed the line of his buttons, down his chest and over his flat stomach, until her fingers bumped against the buckle of his belt. His shirt was neatly tucked into the trousers, so she didn't get a chance to find out how his naked skin would feel under her hand. But there was something else that had stirred her curiosity. Gathering all her Gryffindor courage, Hermione decisively brushed her trembling fingers over the front of his trousers. She almost shied back when Malfoy made a desperate noise, and his hips twitched involuntarily. But then she grew slightly more bold and cupped him through the soft material of his trousers. It was strange and unfamiliar. Hard, but not like steel, like so many steamy romance novels described. Firm, but soft and organic. And sizable, even hidden as it was. Guess he isn't compensating after all, a fleeting thought whispered. But then Malfoy's hips twitched again and aborted, stilted movement, and Hermione squeezed involuntarily. A rough moan escaped him, and that sent a flash of heat right to the center between her legs, making something throb almost painfully. But then fingers closed around her wrist like a gentle vice and pulled her hand away. Insecurity reared its ugly head, and Hermione began to chew her lip, worried she might have done something wrong. Her cheeks burned with embarrassment, but before she could try to push him away to flee, Malfoy raised his hand to her mouth and pressed a soft kiss to the inside of her wrist, right under her thundering pulse. "'You don't know what you're doing to me, Granger.' His voice was a mere whisper as his gaze held hers. "'If I don't stop you now, I won't be able to think clearly. I won't be able to stop. And you deserve so much better.' He lowered his head again, still holding her hand and kissing her again, soft and sweet and gentle in the most heartbreaking way. Then he pulled back, removing his hand from underneath her shirt, but not without brushing his thumb against her nipple one last time. He looked rueful, regretful, like there was nothing he'd rather do than continue. A sentiment shared by her. If Hermione had it her way, he wouldn't stop. But consent was a two-way street, and if he felt like it was wrong to continue for whatever reason, she would respect that, just like she knew he would respect her. And although Malfoy pulled away, he continued to hold her hand. His thumb caressed her knuckles gently, and a distant memory made itself known. The salve he had given her in fifth year, when Umbridge had forced her to use a blood quill. The salve she hadn't shared with anyone else, although she had wanted to. Because he had made her promise, and somewhere along the line he had become important enough for her not to break her word. The salve. Where did you get it? Knowing Malfoy's affinity for potions and his creativity, Hermione wouldn't be surprised if he had come up with it himself. He was clever like that, and had the ability to follow his instinct and go beyond what was written in the textbooks, something she admired as much as she envied it. While she didn't mind trying her hand at new charms, 
previously unexplored ways of arithmancy and spell construction. She had not once dared to stray from the potions textbook. She was all too aware that tinkering with potions was not her strength. Curse Slughorn in his ignorance. Malfoy deserved a spot at Slughorn's dinner party so much more than she did. Snape, Malfoy shrugged softly. He started supplying us with this the moment Umbridge used that damn quill on one of the Slytherin students. Of course, Snape was the head of Slytherin House. And yet, somehow, Hermione had never thought him to be particularly caring. He always carried an air of haughtiness and annoyance, and even though he had spent a lot of his time brewing her potions, she thought he only did so because Dumbledore forced him. Suddenly she felt ashamed. She should have known better. A teacher who didn't care about his students wouldn't put himself between them and a werewolf while wandless, or at all. Oh, she glanced at the back of her hand again. Thank you for the salve and the warning me about Umbridge, and for trying to warn me in Diagon Alley, although I was too stubborn. Don't mention it, Granger, to no one. It will only get us in trouble. Malfoy's voice was soft but insistent, and her stomach sank. Harry's insistent about Malfoy being involved in something no one their age should be involved in suddenly felt very, very real. I also wanted to apologize, she added, for the things I said to you. It was wrong. I know you must miss your father. Merlin, she couldn't even imagine what Malfoy had been going through with the trial and the conviction, and to have a parent locked away in Azkaban. You shouldn't apologize to someone like me, Malfoy replied as he let go of her hand, seemingly taking every bit of warmth with him. Her skin felt cold, and she shivered. And if he hadn't seemed so distant all of a sudden, she might have dared to inch closer and curl up against his chest. Malfoy, you should run back to your common room, Granger, before Porter starts searching for you. Wouldn't want him to find you in a compromising position with an evil little cockroach like me. Who knows what your fellow Gryffindors would think? There was a sardonic smirk on his lips. I never cared much about what other people think, and I wouldn't be ashamed to be seen with you. Hermione assisted, and Malfoy laughed. It was a harsh, ugly sound, lacking all joy. Not yet. You change your mind eventually. Malfoy rose from where he had been kneeling between her legs, raising to his full height again. He buried his hands in the pockets of his trousers, almost as if he was afraid of his resolve crumbling, should he touch her again. Hermione climbed to her feet as well, noticing with burning cheeks that her knees felt weak. "'This isn't the last time, right?' she asked, briefly wondering when she had started wanting him to kiss her. Perhaps sometime between fourth and fifth year. "'No, not yet,' he replied, and that was good enough answer for now. Nodding, Hermione turned to return to her common room, but before she had even taken three steps, his voice stopped her. "'Good night, Granger.' It was barely more than a whisper. Peering back at him over her shoulder, Hermione smiled ever so slightly. Good night, Malfoy. Hermione returned to her common room with slightly swollen lips and flushed cheeks. She hoped that people would ascribe it to her crying rather than being unable to resist the skilled mouth of one Draco Malfoy, but luck was on her side for once. The common room was dark and empty. The students had returned to their beds already, most likely exhausted from the exciting game and the following celebration. How long had she spent being snogged senseless by Draco Malfoy? Hermione snuck up the winding stairs into her dorm room and breathed a sigh of relief when she noticed that the other girls were already asleep. Well, except for Lavender, whose bed was noticeably empty. But Hermione couldn't find it in herself to care about the fellow Gryffindor and what she might be up to with her ginger-haired best friend. Not when her lips were still tingling, and she could still feel the warmth of Malfoy's hands where they had been cradling her jaw, followed the arch of her throat, and played with her hair. Casting a quick cleaning spell on her teeth and face, she changed into her pajamas and crawled underneath her blanket. She fell asleep replaying the memory of how he had touched her again and again. Despite her assurance that Hermione didn't mind Ron and Lavender's very, very handsy and very, very public relationship at all, Harry seemed convinced that her crying was a clear indication that she was desperately in love with Ron and entirely heartbroken. His empathetic looks and constant questions, if she was fine whenever they passed the saccharine couple in the hallways, led Hermione to do something very, very stupid and very, very short-sighted. 
she decided to get a date for Slughorn's party. And because she couldn't very well go with Malfoy, who had once again begun acting like he wasn't aware of her existence while the dark circles underneath his eyes grew, she agreed to go with someone else. Namely, one Cormac McLaggen. Hermione realized how much of a mistake that had been the moment they arrived at the party, because he immediately put an arm around her waist, his hands resting far too low for her taste. The most infuriating thing, whenever Hermione tried to bring a bit of distance between them or stop his wandering hands, McLagan seemed to take it as a challenge. When he pulled her underneath the charmed mistletoe, Hermione had had it. Avoiding his puckering lips at the last second, she made the mistletoe burst into flames and escaped his grabby hands, muttering something about having to use the loo. She hid behind one of the countless drapes, hoping that another, more responsive witch, would catch McLagan's eyes. Hermione briefly wondered what it was about her that seemed to attract spoiled, privileged wizards before deciding that it was best not to inspect that too closely. She was interrupted by Harry. Her best friend's eyebrows twitched almost all the way to his hairline when he found out who her date was, and there was that pity again. Groaning, Hermione escaped before she could be tempted to reach for the dragon tartar, not feeling guilty one bit when she spotted Cormac joining Harry. And even from her hiding spot behind a burly wizard who held some high position at the ministry, she could see Cormac reach for the dragon tartar, only to promptly empty his stomach all over Snape's shoes, who seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. And if she did giggle, then it was purely incidental. At least McLagan seemed sufficiently deterred, having earned enough detention to take his mind off Hermione. So she was finally able to do what she had intended to do when Slughorn had first invited her. Make connections. It was almost ridiculously easy. As soon as Slughorn spotted her, he dragged her to introduce her to a gathering of wizards, who either had seats on the Wizengamot, or were the heads of various departments, singing her praises. Yes, he repeatedly mentioned that she was a muggle-born, and how her talents were extraordinary, especially if one considered that she had been unaware of her talents for most of her life, but Hermione bit her tongue and smiled through these comments. A light of recognition and interest flashed in the Ministry's official's eyes when Slughorn mentioned her moniker as the brightest witch of her age, and how her newt scores would undoubtedly be some of the highest in Hogwarts history. It was worth it, because ten minutes of polite small talk and answering strategic questions with just enough charm and ambition, she was invited by no less than four departments to contact them upon finishing her education, because they would undoubtedly find a place at the Ministry for an ambitious young witch like her. Hermione felt like she floated through the room as she searched for a refreshment, basking in her promising future and the possibilities to help creatures, should everything go according to plan but her euphoria only lasted until Filch burst into the room, dragging Malfoy with him, who claimed that he had intended to sneak into the party. And although he was a good liar, Hermione knew that Malfoy undoubtedly considered himself too good to attend one of Slughorn's parties in the first place. When Snape interfered and told Malfoy to return to the dungeons, and that he would follow him in a moment, Hermione saw her chance. She snuck out within seconds after Malfoy had left, and hurried after his quickly disappearing figure. If he heard her, he didn't show it, because he didn't slow down, never mind turning around to look at her. If anything, his steps became even quicker. Cursing her heels under her breath, Hermione hastened after him. When he seemed to walk even faster, her patience snapped. Draco Malfoy, stop this instant! She called after him, and to her surprise, he did. Are we on a first-name basis now, Granger? He asked, still not turning to face her. Not if you keep ignoring me! Hermione snapped back, belatedly realizing that this was the first time she had called him by his first name, even if only because she wanted him to stop trying to run away from her. "'Did you ever consider that I might be ignoring you for your own good?' His voice was scathing. "'Not that you seem to mind. From what I heard, you're very happy in the arms of McLaggen. Or are you trying to make the weasel jealous after all? The school seems torn about that.' Having finally reached him, Hermione stepped around him so she could look at his face. His expression was pinched and unhappy. "'I am not in love with Ronald Weasley!' she insisted shrilly, because if one more person acted like she was a poor, heartbroken girl, hung up on her best friend, she would start throwing fists again. "'So it's McLagan after all. At least you'll climb the ministry ladder quickly. His family connections will certainly help you.' Malfoy couldn't have sounded more venomous if he tried." She already took a deep breath to give him a lecture, 
but the angry retort on her tongue promptly died when a sudden realization struck her. Was he... jealous? Malfoy, Hermione forced her voice to stay calm. The only reason I went with McLagan was because I want Harry to stop thinking I'm hopelessly in love with Ron, a sentiment which is shared by half the school. He didn't believe her, although the tension in his shoulders lessened slightly. Perhaps it was the champagne, or maybe she had briefly lost her mind, but before she could stop herself, Hermione blurted out the truth. I didn't want to go with McLagan. I didn't want to go with anyone, except one wizard. But he treats me like I don't exist, and when he deigns to talk to me, it's to tell me that I deserve better, and that it would be for my own good to stay away from him. The moment the words left her mouth, Hermione flushed with mortification. She promptly hid her face behind her hands, as she contemplated abandoning her heels to run away and hide, until she found a spell or potion that would erase Malfoy's memories of her involuntary confession. What had come over her? Was she insane? Had someone slipped her hair to see him? Before she could flee, fingers were closing around her wrists and pulling her hands away. She quickly closed her eyes, but Malfoy didn't seem to care. Really, he whispered, breath caressing her face as his lips were close enough to almost brush against hers. Ducking her head, Hermione nodded slightly, and he exhaled sharply. Granger. He sounded... she didn't know. Disbelieving? As if he was choking on something like his world had just stopped for a moment. It didn't matter, because suddenly he was kissing her again, and, oh, that she could get on board with. His hands moved from her wrist to her waist, pulling her closer, and her fingers grabbed the lapels of his suit jacket as she forgot everything around them. He hadn't laughed in her face, hadn't made fun of her for her words and those irritating, irrational feelings that seemed to haunt her. Quite the opposite. Granger, I... Malfoy whispered against her lips, and Hermione's heart skipped in her chest. But then someone pointedly cleared their throat next to them, and Malfoy pulled away as if he had been burnt. Slightly disoriented, Hermione glanced at whoever had interrupted them, ready to throw a hex, only to pale with mortification as she met the eyes of her former potions master and current DADA professor. Severus Snape stood two meters away, watching them with an inscrutable expression on his sallow face— he seemed almost thoughtful. Finally, his mouth turned into a sneer as his dark eyes bore into her. I think your date is looking for you, Miss Granger. You should hurry back, before he tries his hand at whatever other unpalatable monstrosity Slughorn decided to serve his guests. Hermione knew a dismissal when she heard one. Yes, Professor, she said meekly staring down at her shoes as she ducked around him and hurried down the corridor, thoughts racing. Turning the corner, she leaned against the stone wall and tried to calm her buzzing mind. Snape had caught her kissing Malfoy. Maybe he had even heard her stupid, stupid confession. Oh, Merlin, what was she supposed to do? She couldn't try to obliviate one of her professors. This was the worst, absolute worst. No, it could be worse. What if McGonagall had caught them? Or Harry? or Ron. She would have had to drop out and transfer to Bobatons, not because she was ashamed of Malfoy, but because she wouldn't want to face the incessant questions or disbelieving looks. Would you care to tell me what you think you are doing, Draco? Snape's voice cut through the air, pulling her out of her thoughts. I don't know what you mean, Professor, he replied, cold and distant. It seems that you have found yourself entangled with Miss Granger. I know that students are foolish and get caught in the throes of passion and pesky feelings easily, but you should know better. The danger you put her in. Need I remind you what would happen if he found out about your attachment? Malfoy didn't answer. If you truly care for Miss Granger, you will do your best to protect her. And the less she is associated with you, the better for her. You're not the first wizard to find himself enthralled by a muggle-born witch. But it never ends well. The witch always dies. Silence. And now return to the dungeons, Draco. Yes, Professor. Following being caught with Malfoy, Snape's gaze never seemed to leave her. At the same time, Malfoy had returned to ignoring her once more, and between his oppressive silence and her professor's dark eyes, not to mention McLagan's attention, Hermione was relieved when she could finally go home over Christmas break. 
not that it took her mind off of Malfoy, especially not when her mother cheekily inquired whether or not she had finally found herself a boyfriend. The one thing that lifted her spirits, however, was that Ginny seemed to be avoiding Dean once they returned to Hogwarts. It might have allowed Harry to finally ask her out, because his incessant pining was almost as annoying as the rumors about her and Ron, or Ron's constant pawing of Lavender. Or, rather being pawed by Lavender, because following the break, his interest in her seemed to have lessened drastically. It amused Hermione to no end, because while she was supportive of his relationship, the fact that he had entirely forgotten about her and Harry had stung slightly. She thought that they were better friends than that. A few weeks after the second term had started, weeks during which Malfoy seemed to continue heeding Snape's advice, Harry suddenly confided in her that Ron wanted to break up with Lavender, but he didn't know how. Rolling her eyes, she told him to give Ron the advice of saying it straight out, while they were under four eyes because nobody deserved to be strung along, especially not someone who was in love like Lavender. For all her obnoxiousness, she was genuinely a nice person, and seemed to really like Ron. But, being the teenage boy he was, Harry seemed horrified by such directness when it came to feelings, and Hermione mentally noted that it would take a long while until he would finally find the courage to approach Ginny. Between apparating lessons, reporting to Poppy and Snape about her health, trying to stay on top of her study schedule, and glancing at Malfoy at any given opportunity, time passed quickly, and Hermione felt occasionally lonely. Harry was occupied with private lessons given by Dumbledore, and Lavender was still a persistent barnacle at Ron's side. Her annoyance with his inability to communicate with her directly and let her know that he was no longer interested vanished into thin air in March because Ron's birthday ended up being a disaster when he was poisoned and almost died. Had it not been for Harry having a sudden moment of being an absolute genius and saving him with a bezoar. Ron survived, only having to spend two days under Poppy's care, and Hermione shared her notes with him, although she knew that he wouldn't even glance at them. She had the slight suspicion that Ron was more upset about missing the Quidditch game and being replaced by McClagan rather than being poisoned. Sometimes she didn't understand his priorities. And if that wasn't bad enough, McLagan got a little bit too excited during the game, which led to an incident involving a bat, a bludger, and Harry's skull. Praise Merlin for magic, because otherwise a cracked skull would have posed truly dangerous injury. As it was, all it took was Madame Pomfrey's experienced hands for Harry to lay in the infirmary, in the bed Ron had been in just days before, complaining about a headache and not being able to take the apparition test. Ron, on the other hand, was given permission to participate. However, while Hermione passed without much trouble, along with half a dozen other students, including Malfoy, Ron did not. Not that he seemed especially bothered by having to repeat the test with Harry in a few months. On their way back to the castle from Hogsmeade, he seemed positively cheerful. Hermione was relieved that their friendship seemed to warm again, now that he had remembered that there were people other than Lavender Brown in the world. That was until Ron told her that he planned to break up with Lavender. The expression in his eyes made her stomach churn uncomfortable, and she wanted to scream in frustration when he confessed that he had realized some things, and who was actually important to him, with brightly blushing cheeks. It made her panic because her feelings for him had long since disappeared. And then there was regret, because if only he had felt like that two years earlier, things would have been so much easier. Harry finally used the liquid luck. His goal was to get certain memories from Slughorn that involved a young Voldemort and something with immortality, and in this case, Hermione could condone the use of the potion. At least he wasn't using it to get an advantage in his newts or to pass his apparition test. He was successful, which wasn't a surprise since that was the purpose of the potion. What exactly he had found out, he wasn't willing to share, being sworn to secrecy by Dumbledore. It bugged Hermione, but then she remembered that she was keeping secrets as well and wasn't in a position to judge or reprimand him. Meanwhile, Ginny and Dean finally broke up. Ron found the confidence to end things with Lavender, and then Katie Bell returned, which led to Harry starting to talk about Malfoy being a Death Eater once again. Hermione continued to deny it, convinced Harry would continue to voice his suspicions, but leave it at that. But then he returned to the common room shaken and pale, his trousers drenched with water and blood. When they finally got him to talk, Hermione almost fainted. He had found Malfoy in one of the bathrooms. He had tried to get a confession out of him. One thing had led to another, and they had pulled their wands, and he had used one of the spells out of his potions book, 
something called sectum sempra. I didn't know what it would do. I didn't want to hurt him like that. There was so much blood, so much blood, and Malfoy wasn't moving, just lying there, and then Snape came in and used a spell. Hermione had briefly worried she might throw up. Is he all right? She had croaked out, and almost sobbed in relief when Harry had shakenly nodded his head, muttering about Snape having taken him to the infirmary. And then he quietly admitted that the book was dangerous, and that he would need to get rid of it, even if it affected his potions grades negatively. Hermione absent-mindedly agreed, but all she could think about was Malfoy. And although Harry had said that Snape had saved Malfoy, Hermione felt the need to see him for herself to make sure that he truly was all right, because the thought of him being hurt and bleeding and almost dead. No. No. Casting a disillusionment spell on herself, she snuck out of Gryffindor Tower long after curfew. As a prefect, she was aware of patrolling schedules and where the others would be searching for students. The infirmary wasn't an especially popular spot for making out, and so it was rarely patrolled, and unless Malfoy's injuries were so serious that Madame Pomfrey would spend the night in her office in case of an emergency, she should be able to make sure that he was fine without any problems. Pushing the door to the hospital wing open, Hermione slipped inside. She held her breath, but Madame Pomfrey's office was dark, just like the rest of the infirmary, except for a small ball of light hovering on the nightstand of the only occupied bed. Hermione's heart was thumping painfully against her chest as she approached Malfoy's prone form, and she was so overcome by worry that she didn't notice her disillusionment spell slithering off. He looked so pale. Too pale, almost like a ghost. At least they had given him a change of clothes so that he wouldn't have to sleep in his bloody and drenched uniform, even if the black pajamas only enhanced his sickly complexion. Hermione couldn't help herself. She reached for his hand, taking it in hers, because she needed to feel his warmth, to feel that he was still alive, and as well as he could be. She only noticed that she was crying when hot tears ran down her cheeks. I thought I told you not to worry about me. A hoarse voice broke the silence, and Hermione looked up with a quiet gasp, only to meet familiar silver-blue eyes. Her cheeks flushed hotly that he had caught her standing over him while he was sleeping while crying. But then the hand in her grasp turned around and he suddenly linked his fingers with hers. "'I'm an independent witch. I can worry about whoever I choose,' she whispered back, and his mouth twitched into a smile. "'Stubborn witch. You were supposed to stay away from me.' Why did he sound so fond? You don't get to make decisions for me, Hermione sniffed as she hesitantly sat down on the thin mattress of the hospital bed. Besides, I wanted to see if I needed to make plans to bail Harry out of Azkaban, just in case you hadn't made it. A huff of laughter escaped Malfoy. Although it was dry and not particularly joyful, it was music to her ears. If anyone could, it would probably be you, he said tiredly, and she knew that the exhaustion etched in his face wasn't due to Harry's spell alone. It was deeper, bone-deep exhaustion that had built over the entire school year. Whatever he had been caught up in, it wasn't doing him any favors. You should rest, Hermione mumbled quietly, and Malfoy snorted. Rest is the last thing I'm currently thinking about, Granger. What are you wearing, by the way? Surprised, she looked down at herself. It was her normal sleepwear, a loose top and matching pink shorts. Nothing out of the ordinary. I'm wearing pajamas, just like you. Those are not pajamas, Granger. They're barely more than underwear, Malfoy murmured. That looks like something you should only show your husband. I don't have a husband, she retorted. Luckily for me. Otherwise, I might worry about being challenged to a duel for seeing you like this. It didn't stop his eyes from raking over her, lingering at the hem of her shorts that stopped just short of her inner thigh. And suddenly Hermione remembered that Malfoy was raised like the precious pure-blood heir he was, and that wizarding society was at least a century behind the muggle world. He probably blushed at the mere glimpse of an ankle or a collarbone. A small laugh escaped her at the thought of his undoubtedly scandalized expression, should he find out about g-strings or muggle swimwear. If I had a husband— I think he'd rather challenge you for kissing me, all that time you touched me. No, she couldn't say it, not without feeling mortified. Merlin Granger, if I had any blood left, I would be blushing. 
almost dying, had unlocked another facet of him, his humor. But his words quickly made her sober up as she remembered where they were and why. How are you? What did Madame Pomfrey say? Hermione asked quietly, her eyes lingering on the pink line that peeked out of the collar of his shirt. Nothing a few blood-replenishing potions can't fix. But Porter did leave me with some scars. I'll have to get him back for that. He sounded bitter, and Hermione immediately shook her head. You'll do no such thing. I don't want to have to visit either of you in the infirmary again any time soon. She scolded, her eyes still lingering on his chest. From what Harry had told them, the spell had led to cuts on Malfour's upper body, which had been bleeding profusely. Go ahead, Granger. Assure yourself that Madame Pomfrey isn't as incompetent as most of the Hogwarts staff. Before that frown on your face gets permanent, Malfoy muttered, gesturing towards his chest with his free hand. Is it so hard for you to be nice? Hermione wondered, not receiving an answer. But he had given her his permission, and Hermione knew that unless she could assess the damage for herself and make sure that he was truly all right. That didn't stop her fingers from shaking when she freed them from Malfoy's grasp and began to unbutton his shirt. Only a few, just enough to reveal some of his chest. There was a crisscross of pink lines. Four freshly healed cuts adorned his upper body all the way from his shoulders down to his waist. She could only imagine how much they must have bled, and how much didn't he it had taken to get them to heal like this. Pomfrey said they will fade in time, but always be visible. Malfoy explained, and she could feel his chest rumble underneath her hands. Oh, Merlin, she was touching his naked chest. Oh, Hermione instinctively reached for her scar that sat neatly in the center of her sternum. Once a purple line, it had slowly faded until it was merely a flicker of silvery skin. Malfoy noticed, because his eyes zeroed in on the low cut of her top. I heard you were cursed in the D.O.M., a burning curse. Yes, Hermione hesitated. Do you want to see? She whispered and heard Malfoy's throat click as he swallowed. He nodded, pushing himself up with a slight struggle. Hermione quickly reached towards him and pulled up his pillow so that he could settle comfortably against the iron headboard of the creaky bed. When she leaned back, he noticed how she had unintentionally allowed him a glance down her top, and that his eyes were still lingering on her chest. But Hermione wouldn't lose her courage now, not when she wanted this as much as he did. Shifting slightly to sit more comfortably, she began to pull up her shirt, only to be stopped by Malfoy. May I? he asked quietly. This time it was her turn to swallow dryly. Heart thumping heavily, she nodded in agreement, and allowed his hands to replace hers. But the angle was awkward, and he was clearly struggling to gather his strength. He had lost more blood than he wanted to admit. So Hermione made a bold decision. She shifted again, and simply threw a leg over his hip, not stopping until she was sitting in his lap, not unlike the time on the train at the end of fifth year. Only this time, she felt something hard and warm press against her, even through the blanket that covered Malfoy's lower body. Is this okay? she whispered, worried that it might be uncomfortable for him, but Malfoy nodded before she even had finished the question. More then, he assured her. Then his hand settled on her waist again, fingers slipping underneath her top. His eyes met hers again, confirming that she was still consenting, and then he pulled up her pajamas. Hermione only remembered that she wasn't wearing a bra when Malfoy suddenly inhaled sharply. Cheeks burning, she withstood the urge to cross her arms and hide her revealed chest, worried that it might disappoint him. She was all too aware that Ron had repeatedly raved about Lavender's lush chest, and although she tried not to let it bother her, suddenly her insecurities were back. It wasn't like she was entirely flat, but it was barely more than a handful, if that. You're so... Malfoy's voice died, and Hermione was about to tug her top back down when he seemed to remember how to form words. Pretty. Oh, she whispered, only now recognizing the glint in his eyes for what it was. Desire. He desired her. He didn't see faults or flaws. It stunned her enough that she didn't protest when he pulled off her shirt the rest of the way, helping him pull it over her head and free her arms. Then he dropped it on top of the blankets carelessly, his gaze still transfixed on her naked breasts. 
It was only when he raised a finger to touch the silver line between them that she remembered what she had initially wanted to show him. Can I? His hands twitched, and Hermione didn't need him to elaborate. She nodded, the memory of his hand underneath her shirt all too present. But to her surprise, he didn't cup her chest. Instead, he reached for her hair, gently removing the clip that held her curls in place until they were spilling over her shoulders, just long enough to reach her pink nipples. You don't know how often I thought about this, Granger. About you, Malfoy confessed. Ever since the Yule Ball. His voice broke off at her quiet gasp. So long, she asked, shivering as he wrapped one of her curls around his finger. Of course. Do you think I would have given that salve to anybody? Or warned any of your friends about Umbridge? Or did you see me kiss Weasley after Potter pulled him out of the blasted lake? Malfoy asked, and that made her laugh quietly. It was more a giggle than a laugh, filled with a cautious joy and happiness. To know that she wasn't the only one plagued by feelings for someone she shouldn't have. To know that he might like her, too. I'm not supposed to, Hermione hummed as she ran her hands over his shoulders and across his naked chest. His skin was just as soft as she had imagined it. Not a trace of hair or blemishes, other than the scars. Just as pale as the rest of him. She wanted to see more of him, of his shoulders and his arms, so she tugged on the black silk. Take it off, Hermione demanded, but Malfoy shook his head. I think we both know why that would be a bad idea. Suddenly, Hermione couldn't breathe. She remembered Harry's suspicions, suspicions she had argued against because she refused to admit that at times they made sense, because she refused to acknowledge the glaring truth. Her throat was tight as she put one hand on the inside of his left arm, and Malfoy nodded ever so slightly. But there was only one question on her mind. Did you have a choice? There was that sardonic smile again. Do any of us? He asked in return, and that was all the confirmation she needed. Instead of answering him, she simply inclined her head and kissed him softly, briefly, gently, hoping to convey the things he would never allow her to voice. I don't deserve you, Granger, Malfoy repeated once again, but they didn't stop him from touching her, and it didn't stop her from touching him. Respecting his desire to keep his shirt on and hide the glaring sign of why they would never find happiness together. She kept her hands on his chest and abdomen, caressing and exploring the skin, while he explored her. His hands cupped her breasts, squeezing experimentally, and brushing her nipples until he found out exactly what made her gasp and squirm. Once he had his fill, they continued down her waist, across her hips, into her naked legs, where they brushed against her thighs, slipping underneath her shorts until they reached the junction of her legs. The flare of want that made her arch her back in surprise, and Malfoy looked thoughtfully for a fraction of a second. Then he suddenly leaned forward, and, oh! That was his mouth on her breast, closing around her nipple and sucking. A moan escaped her at the foreign but oh-so-delicious sensation, and her fingers buried themselves in his hair and pulled at him closer. Her hips moved slightly, instinctively grinding against the bulge in his trousers as she chased that delicious feeling. As she rolled her hips again, his thumb suddenly slipped higher, underneath her knickers, right where she had started to get wet. It bumped against her most sensitive spot by accident, and she didn't know who was more surprised, Malfoy or her. I'm sorry, he began, about to pull away, but she shook her head. It's fine. Merlin, her voice was so hoarse she barely recognized it. It... it felt good. A low whine escaped Malfoy and when he was kissing her chest again, and his thumb was back this time more insistent, the material of her shorts and knickers restricted him, but neither of them cared. Perfect. So perfect. Malfoy panted against her chest while his fingers were still caressing her. He was hesitant and gentle, more gentle than she had expected, and his inexperience was obvious, but that didn't make it any less exciting. Besides, Malfoy was a quick learner and he didn't need more than three or four brushes against her clit to find out what made her gasp and mule quietly. Gathering wetness with his fingers, he focused on her clit until Hermione was panting. She could feel herself becoming more and more sensitive and surprisingly close to the edge. Malfoy, I... Her voice died as a high whine escaped her throat, and then it was too much. 
Her hips moved on their own, seeking more friction as she held on to Malfoy for dear life. Pleasure raced through her, blinding her for a moment as his clever fingers continued to stroke her. She didn't know how long it lasted, seconds that felt like a small eternity. When she came down with a sharp gasp, lungs burning as if she had held her breath the entire time, she had become boneless, only held up by Malfoy's arm around her waist. His fingers were still inside her knickers, slowly bringing her down to earth and only moving away when she was whining from oversensitivity and trying to squirm out of his hold. She could see them glitter with her wetness in the low light, but couldn't find it in herself to blush about it, not when she felt so deliciously sated and when her legs were still trembling from the aftershocks. Suddenly Malfoy groaned and the arm around her waist turned laxed as he sunk into his pillows. Hermione chased the haze away that had clouded her mind, only noticing now how pale he was. He looked as if he was about to faint. Malfoy! she exclaimed, quickly helping him lay down, her hands helplessly fluttering over his prone form. What to do? Stop worrying, Granger. Just a bit dizzy, he muttered, but didn't batter her hands away. I should have stopped you, she grumbled unhappily, as she reached for her top and then her wand, casting a cleaning spell to his hands and another to rebutton his shirt. Malfoy had gathered his wand as well, and was casting a subtle scourgify in the direction of his lap. For a second she wondered why, but then the realization struck her, and her cheeks warmed once again. Oh, he had— There were those butterflies again, but the knowledge that he had enjoyed himself just as much as she had was comforting and reassuring. But casting the spell seemed to have drained him of the last of his energy, because he went lax and his eyes fluttered shut. Hermione cast a small monitoring spell that she occasionally used to check on her health, just in case the lingering effects of Dolohoff's curse acted up again. But his vitals were fine. He was simply exhausted. Slowly, she climbed off his lap and straightened her clothes. When she looked at him again, he seemed fast asleep. It made him look strangely vulnerable, in a way that she had never seen before, and the urge to protect him arose in her. So Hermione carefully tugged his blankets higher, until he was sufficiently tucked in, and brushed a stray lock of his hair out of his face. Then she put his wand on the nightstand, and was about to disillusion herself when his voice stopped her. "'Don't leave,' he murmured. His eyes still closed, but one arm had snuck out of the blankets and was reaching for her. "'Just a little longer.' Hermione knew it was risky, that Madame Pomfrey might come in to check on him, but she couldn't find it in herself to care. Instead, she sat down on the side of his bed again, taking his hands in hers. She stayed until his breathing had evened out, and his hand had gone lax. Then she tucked him in once again and left, but not without brushing a kiss against his forehead. It was late enough that even the prefects had undoubtedly returned to their respective houses, which was why a small scream escaped her when she slipped out of the infirmary and found herself face to face with none other than Professor Snape. "'Out after curfew, Miss Granger.' he drawled disapprovingly, and Hermione closed her eyes. She would get so much detention, months and months of detention, and he'd undoubtedly deduct countless house points. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Her professor continued, and Hermione shook her head. No, I'm sorry, sir, she whispered, peeking out at him through her unruly hair. He was once again staring at her with his inscrutable expression that he had already worn when he had caught her and Malfoy in the middle of the hallway. "'I shall escort you back to your common room, to ensure that you won't find yourself in places you shouldn't be, Miss Granger.' "'Yes, sir.' Hermione ducked her head and followed him dutifully through the sleeping castle. Her mind was reeling as she tried to come up with arguments or ways to prevent him from informing McGonagall, or Merlin forbid the headmaster about having caught her sneaking out of the infirmary. "'Professor,' she began as they were approaching the sleeping portrait of the fat lady, but he didn't give her the time to say anything. Instead, he suddenly pulled his wand, and then the sensation of an egg cracking and spilling over her head engulfed her as he cast a disillusionment charm that was undoubtedly much more effective than hers. "'Quiet, Miss Granger,' he straightened and stared down at her judgmentally. You will hold your tongue and not speak until I dismiss you. What you and Mr. Malfoy are doing is beyond foolish, and puts both of you in more danger than you could possibly comprehend. There were muggle-born witches before you who were too close to wizards they shouldn't have associated with, 
and I will not stand by and watch the same fate befall you. I've spent far too much time brewing those blasted potions for you, just so that you can throw yourself headfirst into danger. Even if she had found her voice, Hermione wouldn't have known what to say. I dislike repeating myself, Miss Granger. But since Mr. Malfoy is clearly incapable of heeding advice, I shall try my luck with you. Stay away from him, as far away as possible. And if I catch you out past curfew again, even if it is to alert the headmaster of a dragon wreaking havoc in the entry hall, I will make sure that you spend every evening in detention until you have taken your newts. Is that clear? Yes, Professor. Good. He ended the spell before pointing his wand at the portrait guarding Gryffindor Tower. It opened without the fat lady waking up, ensuring that her little nighttime adventure stayed between herself, Malfoy, and her professor. Good night, Professor. And thank you. She whispered as she stepped into the common room. Don't test my patience, Miss Granger. Then the portrait swung shut. Heart still racing, Hermione hurried into her dorm room and pulled the curtains of her bed shut. Only then did she realize that Professor Snape hadn't even deducted house points. Hermione spent the next week blushing at random intervals as she remembered her night with Malfoy. Malfoy, who was soon dismissed by Pomfrey and ready to return to his dorm. But this time, he didn't go back to ignoring her. Quite the opposite. Although he never approached her, his gaze seemed to linger on her. Much to Professor Snape's annoyance, as it seemed, because her D.A.D.A. professor was back to watching her like a hawk, and making pointed inquiries whenever she had returned to the hospital wing to make sure she was responding appropriately, now that they were reducing the potions in an attempt to taper her off them entirely. In return, Hermione tried to act like the perfect, diligent student who wouldn't dare to break any rules, going as far as leaving the library on time and spending as much time as possible with her friends which included attending the last Quidditch game of the year with as much cheer as she could fake. Which wasn't much, because Gryffindor won once again, and put everybody from their house into a cheerful mood. There was another celebration, this time without Lavender dragging Ron into a secluded corner. Instead, it was Harry who got a kiss. But much later, and in private, which Hermione only found out when he confessed it to her with slightly pink cheeks, apparently Ginny was entirely over Dean, and had now realized how she felt for Harry good. They were well suited for each other. Because whenever things look good for Harry, a catastrophe quickly followed. And it did. It was only a few weeks before the end of the year when Hermione hurried out of the library, once again, late. She hadn't intended to break curfew, but she had gotten caught up from studying and forgotten the time. Shouldering her satchel, she waved a quick goodbye to Madame Pince, who was sorting the last books into a high shelf before undoubtedly locking up, and made her way towards Gryffindor Tower. She barely made it down the corridor when she spotted Malfoy hurrying in her direction. He looked frazzled, almost panicked, and promptly broke into a sprint when he saw her. Granger. His voice was thin as he grabbed her arms, holding her in place. Malfoy, is everything all right? Good Godric, he looked as pale as he had when Harry's curse sliced him up. Has something happened? No, not yet, anyway. He glanced over his shoulder almost frantically. You need to return to your dorm right now and stay there. Do you hear me? Merlin, he looked as if he would throw up. Why? What is going on? Fear started to prickle at her neck. I can't tell you. It's not important. You need to listen to me. Return to your common room now. Not unless you tell me what's going on. Hermione was tempted to stomp her foot, but Malfoy simply shook his head. Please, Granger, he begged. I can't risk. You need to. Malfoy, she said sharply and put her hands on his cheeks almost flinching away when she noticed how cold he was, as if all warmth had left his body. Tell me what's going on. I can't. Malfoy sounded pained. Just please. Okay. I will go to my common room, I promise. She tried to soothe, and her heart ached when she saw relief flare in his eyes. Good, good, yes. Now he was frantic again. His hands moved away from her arms, and he reached into the pockets of his robes, procuring something silver. Before she could ask him what it was, he had already grabbed her hand and then something cool was touching her skin, feeling like metal. When he pulled back to reach into his pockets again, she realized that he had attached a bracelet to her wrist. And not just any bracelet. 
It was a band of delicately cut diamonds that glittered like stars in the flickering light of the torches, and right in the center was a large black diamond that radiated power. The bracelet is laid in protective rooms, he explained as he procured a small bag that clinked faintly, and a vial filled with blue swirling liquid. Promise me you'll wear it. Hermione wanted to protest, because this looked like it was worth at least a small castle, but the expression in his eyes stopped her. Something was happening, something significant, something that would change their lives and the world forever. War. So she merely nodded wordlessly and blinked rapidly to chase away the tears. Good, Malfoy exhaled quietly. This is from Snape. He says you'll know what to do. He handed her the clinking bag, and then he held out the vial. And this is from me. What is it? Hermione asked, peering at the blue liquid. A mild sleeping draft. It will last six hours. Malfoy glanced over his shoulder again. I need you to go to your dorm and take it. Why? Because I can't risk you getting involved, Granger. I can't. I need to know you're safe, at least for now. His voice was a mere whisper, and Hermione was already about to shake her head when he suddenly leaned forward and kissed her. Please, Granger. Promise me you'll go to your dorms. Lay down in your bed and drink the potion. Please, promise me. She wanted to protest desperately, but the pain in his voice stopped her. What about my friends? She wouldn't simply lie down and take it while leaving her friends to walk headfirst into danger. They're safe. They're not the target. But you are. There are some who want to find you specifically, and I need to make sure you're out of reach. They won't be able to get to you. His words were almost the same as in Diagon Alley, when he had first warned her that she had a target on her back. Apparently, Dalahoff wasn't the only one after her. Okay. Her own words were shaking. I promise. I promise I'll go to my dorm and take it. Malfoy's eyes fluttered closed, and he exhaled with something akin to relief. When they opened again, they were filled with pain and regret. Before you go, I need you to know. His tongue darted out as he wet his lips nervously. The things you said at Slughorn's party. What you feel. It isn't wasted. And if things were different, I would... It doesn't matter. But I need you to know that I'm sorry. For everything. And then he pulled her into another kiss. A kiss that tasted of apologies and tears and goodbyes, before he promptly stepped back. You need to go. Now. Head swimming from his words and his confession and his kiss. Hermione blinked at him. She couldn't leave him like this. Not when there was so much to say. But she knew that they didn't have enough time. Promise me that you will stay safe, Draco. His first name spilt from her tongue effortlessly. And suddenly she regretted not having used it earlier. Only if you promise the same, Hermione, he whispered back. Nodding once, Hermione turned around and hurried back to her common room, clutching the bag and vial against her chest. She didn't glance back, knowing that she would break her promise to him if she would. Instead, she marched on, past the fat lady and through the still lively common room. She told Ron that she was tired when he tried to convince her to join him for the game of wizard chess, changed into her pajamas and crawled into her bed. She closed the curtains, tried to force the knot in her throat down, and brought the vial to her lips. She awakened when the sky turned gray to a different world. Death Eaters had infiltrated Hogwarts and destroyed the Great Hall, as well as Hagrid's hut. Snape had killed Dumbledore, and the war had begun. Draco had let the Death Eaters into the castle through a vanishing cabinet that he had secretly repaired in the Room of Requirement, disarming Dumbledore on top of the Astronomy Tower and making it easy for Snape to kill their headmaster. Hermione's heart shattered. 